<laughs> okay, I gotta clear my throat. All right, now you can keep talking and shake hands. <laughs> All right, welcome, and it's good to see you. If you're visiting with us this morning, we hope you just kick back, relax. We're gonna have a good time this morning. Uh, happy Mother's Day to the moms out there. And uh, if, if you're a mom and you didn't get the little uh, uh, slip of paper for the drawing, we're gonna have a drawing later. Let's see, what do we got here? Um, all right, we got Starbucks. What mom doesn't need Starbucks? Well, if you're a coffee drinker, but you probably need Starbucks if you're a mom. You, moms know what a, moms get that joke, right? Uh, and then Panera, pretty amazing, right? Good stuff. They probably have coffee there too, so you can get that there. Um, so if you didn't get a slip of paper for the drawing, go ahead and lift a hand and our ushers will make sure you, mothers, mothers, if you're a mom, if you're an adult woman, that doesn't count. You need to be a mom because it's Mother's Day. And we're not, uh, we're not leveling here. No leveling. You know what leveling is? Oh, it's Mother's Day, but we love dads too. No. That's later. That's in June. We just love mom today. Well, you should still love dad, but... Um, all right, everybody, get, everybody got it? <laughs> like maybe, yeah. I'll give, yeah, maybe I'll give some comparisons. All right, everybody have, everybody have one? And you, and you threw it in the offering plate? All right, so we'll do a drawing later if we have time. We'll get around to it. Unless the sermon's too long, all bets are off. Uh, no, we'll get, around to, we'll get around to blessing moms. That's a great idea to bless mom. Um, all right, we gotta, let's, start, let's start off with a video. Do we have a video? We'll start this message off. We've got to get this message over with so we can get to the drawings. We don't even have to. We don't, technically, we don't have to do this part. But. Not going? All right. We're already doing way better than last week. Come on, somebody, if you were here last week. There was like 25 weird things that happened to us. Um, if you came back because you wanted to see how we handled it this week, I hope you're not disappointed. But things are going a little better uh, this week. All right, so we're in a series this morning, and uh, we're, we're into week three. We're uh, talking about uh, the always God. And so we've been talking about that God is reliable, he's dependable, he's trustworthy. There's so much more I would love to say about that. Uh, it's such a, a great topic, such a, a, a wonderful thing that God is reliable. Um, other religions, other quote-unquote gods are not reliable. They change their mind, their mood changes, they're, they're moody one day, and then, then they decide to throw lightning bolts at people. And uh, we have a God that's dependable and reliable. If we know him in the scriptures, we can count on him to be the same today. And so we've been emphasizing that. Isn't that good news? Yes. So in week one, we learned that God not only spoke in days of old, but God still speaks today in, in various and different ways. Last week, we, we talked about God still hears. And so God still hears us. He's still a prayer answering God. And this morning, we want to talk about the reality that God still sees all right, that one may come, sound unusual. Well, okay, he speaks, he hears, but he still sees. And when we say that God still sees us, the idea there is that God still cares about the situation that we're in. Are you with me this morning? I'd like to welcome those of you that are joining with us online. Happy Mother's Day to you as well. We're glad that you decided to join us this morning. So a God who sees is a God who cares. That's encouraging. That should give you hope because it means that God has not forgotten about you. That, that's, that's great news this morning. And that includes mothers and fathers and the childless and youngsters. God has not forgotten us. Have you ever felt like you're going through some trouble or a trial and there's just no letting up? If you've ever felt like that, you are unique to that experience. Something clearly is wrong with you. No, right? We all have experienced that. I like to say that we go through valleys, and then we're on the mountaintop, and then we go through a valley. And then if we're going through a difficult time, it's just a little while until things get better. But sometimes 
the difficulty just seems to go on and on and on and on. It doesn't seem to let up. We can't catch a break. I know I've had many experiences like that in my life. How about at work? You're trying to be a Christian at work. You're trying to honor God. You're trying to uh, uh, do a good job for the employer. And it's the schemers, the conniving, the backbiting, the, the, the godless, uh, those that will throw somebody else under the bus to get ahead. And it seems to work sometimes. Maybe that's, maybe that's your situation. You've experienced something like that. Or maybe it's just the world in which we live. Uh, all you have to do is turn on the news. Now, remember that the news is they make more money the longer they can keep you turned in. And fear works on you in a way that happiness and joy does not. Are you here this morning? They tried the happy news channel. No, but it was five minutes, right? You give up. Like it's, I can't do, I can't do this. It's just a fear keeps you locked in. But we know that the world is a fallen, broken place. And so all we need to do is turn on the news and, and we hear awful, horrible things. Although this week we got a bit of good news. Um, the Supreme Court has uh, made a decision or there's going to make a decision on Roe v. Wade. And it looks like, yes, in my lifetime, they have overturned Roe versus Wade and abortion. I know you don't know how to respond to that because you think that's a political topic. What do we do? Is he getting political on us? No, I'm getting moral on you. Come on, somebody. Amen. Right? It's not political. I, I was against abortion from, just from reading the Bible and being a Christian. I was against it. I was horrified by it. Um, they always said that you shouldn't be from a youth. They said you shouldn't be uh, a single issue voter. And uh, I've known multitudes of single issue voters for years and years and years and years and years. So it's, I understand it's a, uh, I kind of listened to both sides of that this week. And uh, just to not condescend and know everything, I thought, well, let me hear the other side of this. It's been a while and I, I recognize that if you're a woman, an abor uh, uh, a pregnancy is, it's interesting we talk about this on Mother's Day, it's, uh, it's a big deal, right? And it's not just the pregnancy, I've got news for you. Come on, moms. Amen. It's the child rearing, right? Like it's, it's, not, it's not like, oh, I had the baby, all my troubles are over. <laughs> the, birth, the birth is one of the easier things, right? The birth is... The birth's one of the easiest. So I understand it's two, but it's two bodies wrapped up in one, but separate, separate DNA. I'm not saying that, oh, ladies, you know, no big deal. Um, you know, it's no big deal. Just have the baby, just raise the kid. You know, it's, it's, it's easy. So I, I can appreciate, I try to, you know, I think if we're thinking, we try to put ourselves into the position of somebody else and say, well, how would I look at this if, if the shoe were on the other foot? So I can, I can appreciate that and I can understand that. Uh, however, life is hard sometimes and uh, we make the right decisions. Uh, I have never been in the position to need to decide whether I was going to get an abortion or not. But I've had plenty of opportunities to take the easy way out, to do the thing that was most convenient or to do what I felt was right. And maybe nobody else thought it was right. Maybe, else, maybe nobody else even knew, but I didn't want to compromise my principles. Maybe I didn't get my name in lights, and maybe I didn't become famous for it, and maybe nobody called me a hero, but I came, if I were to come against my own principles, that's a devastating, devastating thing. So we have opportunities to do that in our lives. So I don't think that's a light thing, but uh, Christians from the very beginning have always stood up for life. Because it's not just infants, it's the elderly. And uh, days gone by, they were like, you're not of use anymore, we'll just get rid of you as well. And it was Christians that said, maybe that's not such a good idea. Uh, slave uh, Christians were instrumental in ending slavery, voluntarily ending slavery, not a slave revolt, but ending slavery. Like maybe human beings shouldn't be treated like uh, material possessions to be abused. And maybe we shouldn't throw them into the Colosseum and have them fight lions and, and gladiators. Maybe we should preserve the life of slaves and, and other human beings and the elderly. And how about the sick? Christians are also largely responsible for hospitals rather than, well, you're sick, good luck, right? Like uh, we don't have time for this. 
and was Christians that said, maybe we should take care of people. Early, early hospitals, um, you know, doctors didn't just show up, but the earliest hospitals were places more like a hospice, where they're like, we don't know what to do for you, but we're going to love you and care for you and minister to you and do whatever we can until you pass from this life until the next. And so Christians have a history of protecting, preserving life. So that's an encouraging thing. And hey, it happened on the week of Mother's Day. So a kind, of a, kind of a great thing. All right, was that too political or not political enough? All right, write in the comments. Tell me in the comments, all right? It'll be too late, I won't see it. Um, but it's, but it's uh, you know, I, I don't think that's a political thing. So some people say, you know what, you should talk about abortion more. Well, I used to do that when I was a younger man. Like, that's a, that's a, I feel very strongly about that. But you know what happened? You know why we don't talk about it more? Because we started, the church started to grow. And then you have ladies that have had abortions. That we don't want to beat up on. We don't want to beat up on the ladies that have had abortions. Come on, Christians, are you with me? Like, God can forgive you for that. God will forgive you for that. If you've asked him, he has forgiven you for that. There is redemption and wholeness for you. We don't want to beat up on ladies on Mother's Day. <laughs> let, me, let me think about that. We don't, want to, we don't want to beat up on the ladies ever. So if you go, why, are you, why don't you talk about that more? Because I don't want to break people that are already hurting. Are you with me this morning? Is that okay? Is that a compromiser? Or is that maybe loving people? All right. All right. Let's move on because... Now, your discomfort is making me uncomfortable. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to move on. We, sh we shouldn't have to feel strange when we, when we uh, bring up moral issues in church. All right. So we've, been in, we've probably all been in positions where, we're, where we've said, God, are you seeing this? Are you, are you aware? God, do you even know what's going on in my life? And so we want to take a look at the Christians in the early church. We'll, we'll look at First Peter here. And Peter is writing to Christians that we're experiencing hardship and trials. Um, some of them were uh, being persecuted for their faith. Some were being uh, killed for their faith. And Peter writes to encourage them in 1 Peter uh, chapter 5. He writes to encourage believers to trust in Jesus, to put their hope and to put their hope in him. He reminds them that God still sees and cares about them. All right, let's look at 1 Peter 5, 6, what he writes. Remember, a church that's, that's having a difficult time. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. I like that part. He'll lift us up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. So he's given us some instruction here. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, lion looking for someone to devour. Isn't that a good reminder? Like, that's a good reminder. Like, just remember that there's an enemy that is, he's looking for your destruction. You should, you should probably pay that some attention from time to time. All right, verse nine, resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. All right, so we're, I'm not the only one suffering. And look, and the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. So we're talking this morning about God still sees. And I've got some, some great things that I want to share with you this morning. I'm excited about it. So um, the first thing that I want to share with you that God sees, he sees what we do. He sees our lives. He sees what we're, what we're up to. Psalm 33 uh, verse 13 says that from heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. Isn't that, isn't that good to know? He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. He watches us from on high. Proverbs 5 21 says, for man's ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all his paths, or all that they do. Proverbs 15, 3. Uh, Proverbs 15, 3. Okay, I'll 
deciding to read from here or read from, read from there. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. doesn't matter where, which category you fall into this morning. His eyes are on you. I have a recommended category for you, uh, but it, it doesn't matter. His eyes are upon us all. So I'm getting my translations uh, turned around here. Second Chronicles. Let's look at Second Chronicles. You got time for another one? All right. Mom said you have time for another one. All right. Second Chronicles 16 says, For the eyes of the Lord, one of my favorite verses, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You, and then we'll, the next part is context. We don't need that. But the eyes of the Lord range through, and I think it's the King James that says they roam to and fro, to and fro throughout the whole earth, um, looking for someone whose hearts are committed to him. God's eyes are roaming the earth, looking for people to strengthen, to, uh, to encourage Right? And then Matthew, we'll get to the New Testament where Jesus says, But when you pray, uh, yeah, verse 4, uh, so that your giving may be in secret. There's obviously something uh, that comes before this, but we'll pick it up here in verse 4. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. <coughs> verse 5, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, Jesus said, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So Jesus communicates the same idea that God sees us when, we, when we're praying, when we're uh, when we're ministering to others, when we're doing good things, Jesus tells a parable where he says that if you're ministering to those in prison and those that are hungry and those that are in need and your, your clothing, the naked, that, that the Lord is, is, his eyes are on those things. He sees those things. Now, most of the time when I do good things, it's because I'm such a good person. Thank you. Thank you. Can you amen sarcastically? I heard the sarcasm in it. It was still an amen though. Um, I do, I feel like you can't tell if I'm joking sometimes today. I'll have to, I'll have to be more clear about that. Um, sometimes my renewed spirit, sometimes my changed heart, sometimes because God has done a work in me, I can genuinely do good things <laughs> because I'm a, a changed man, right? <laughs> but it does help. <laughs> but sometimes on my off days, are you with me? You have your off days too. Sometimes on my off days, it's nice to know, well, he is watching after all. Like, I, like, I, like, I don't want to do this, but I do kind of want the Lord to see me do this. All right. So if you need that encouragement, but that counts, right? That counts. Um, that, that's kind of what Jesus was teaching here, that, that when you're good, when you serve others, when you minister, when you help the less fortunate, God sees that and God rewards you for that. And so sometimes I do it because I'm noble and good and pure of heart, a change which was wrought in me by the Spirit of God. And sometimes I do it because I want the reward and you promised. <laughs> but whatever, the world's, the world's a better place either way. Come on, somebody, right? But even Jesus points out, God the Father is watching you and he will reward you when he sees you do these kinds of things. God notices if you... If you are blessing others um, and you feel like God doesn't notice, he does notice. Now, he also sees our disobedience and sin. So all that stuff I said about like on the good side, just, you know, you can apply it to the, the negatives too, right? God, God is, is watching and that has straightened me out before also. Your silence makes me think it's only me. I'm the only one that says, well, God is going to, you know, I, I can't get away with this. He's going to see what I do. Maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just do the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah 16, 17 says, for my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from me, nor is their iniquity concealed 
from my eyes. The Bible has a lot to say about where God's eyes fall and, and that he's paying attention. Psalm 90, verse 8 says, You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. Nothing, but the point is, nothing gets past him. He sees everything. We, we see that in the scriptures, and friends, that is still true today. And that's why Peter is writing this passage in our text this morning. That's why he's writing, because of persecution and difficulty that they're experiencing. He wants them to know that God sees all this, and God is paying attention. And you can, you can cast your cares and your anxieties upon him because he truly does care for you. And it doesn't mean that they weren't going through difficulty. It doesn't mean that, well, God, if you're really watching me, then I shouldn't go through any hardship whatsoever to begin with. That's not what Peter said. Peter said that in your hardship, in your difficulties, in your trials, in your persecutions, that while you're going through those things, God still cares for you. He has his eye on you. And there's a promise of deliverance at the end as well. That, w- that would be great to focus on. That's not my point this morning, but, but there are some promises that we see at the end there. So what kind of things does God see? God sees what we do, right? That's, that's probably clear to most of us. But I think what's really important for us to remember is that God sees what we don't. He sees those things that we don't see. Peter said, hey, the enemy is roaming about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to destroy. Uh, we, we should consciously resist him. And, and I, I, I don't see into the, the, to the spirit realm, but God can see attacks that come against me. You know, sometimes we have difficulty in our lives because of just the world that we live in. We just live in a fallen, broken world. It's, it's not going to be perfect here. And sometimes we experience difficulty because of things that we've done. We've caused it. I won't ask for a show of hands, but those are my least favorite. <laughs> the, the dumb things that I did. And then like, I, I know why I'm going through this because I was a knucklehead. That's, that's why I'm going through it. And sometimes it's the enemy, that, that roaring lion, that's attacking. God, God sees that when we don't. Paul reminds us that the warfare that we fight is not against flesh and blood, but it's against uh, spiritual entities, right? It, it's against our, our enemy, Satan. Um, and, uh, and, and, his, and his forces. So God sees those things. He sees what we don't see. He has a different perspective than us. He doesn't just see our uh, obedience or our disobedience. He also sees our motivations. He sees our heart and, and what's driving us. Suddenly I feel convicted because I just said, sometimes I do nice things for the reward. It doesn't say that we can't, it doesn't say that we can't do that. Um, but God does see the motivation. Like what, why, why do we do it? Your heart is important to him. That's the God that we serve. And the reason your heart is important to him is because through the Holy Spirit, we have the ability to, to live a, a different kind of a life, that we've been renewed, we've been changed. And, and it's like in the Old Testament, when uh, those that fear God weren't filled with the Spirit, it's like, just keep these rules. Just try to keep the evilness at bay. Just, just try to hold the fort until Jesus shows up. Because when Jesus shows up, then believers are going to be filled with the Spirit and, and you're going to actually have a change that occurs inside. And so the heart is important to God because it's possible for our hearts to be renewed and changed. Right? That, that says a lot about the power of God at work in our lives. Jeremiah 17.10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. Proverbs 21.2 says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. The Lord weighs the heart. So he has a different perspective. He not only sees what we do, but he sees what we don't. Um, I, I love the story, and we'll take a look at the scripture here in a minute. Maybe, maybe you remember when Samuel was called to anoint the next king of Israel. Saul wasn't doing such a great job. And God said, go to this family, go to Jesse. And, and Jesse gets all the sons and lines them up. And Samuel sees, uh, I believe it was the oldest son, and says, man, that's a, 
that he, that's a handsome, striking fellow. You remember, David wasn't even in the lineup as the youngest of the brothers. Like, like we'll get all the good brothers. David was good. He was good. Um, but they're like, you can't be talking about the little guy. He's out watching the sheep. You can't be talking about, you can't be talking about him. Um, so, so Jesse gets all the sons, and Samuel, the prophet, looks at the one and says, man, that's, Lord, I'm really not in the spirit right now, but even my, I can just tell with my human senses, that's got to be the guy. And God says, yeah, that's not the guy. You are wrong about the guy. Um, Samuel was impressed with this uh, son, the oldest son, and God told him, uh, guess again. If you, if you don't know the story, it's a great story. Samuel goes through all these impressive young men, and it's, God doesn't say that it's any of them. And Samuel's like, what else you got? There's some other kids around? Like, did, you're miss, did, like, did you forget about some kids or something? Like, well, there's, that, there's the youngest guy out there. Right? Get, kind of a funny story. But 1 Samuel 16, verse 7 says this. This is what the Lord spoke to Samuel. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God has a different perspective. And there's a great illustration for this. Uh, I love this illustration. So we talked about God hearing last week, and, and uh, we got into a little bit like maybe why prayers aren't answered and I, I didn't give every reason why prayers might not be answered, but we touched on that a little bit. And one of those things might be that God has a different perspective. Like his timing's different, and he's weighing so many different factors, right? Like, like and I, I can tell you that in my life, there have been times where I cried out to God for something, and I, I know there's at least two that, that really, really stood out in my life. And I'm like, God, you know, I'm, I believe in miracles. What's up? <laughs> you know, I got faith and the whole thing. This could really, like, I could really use this. And I, I know, there's, there, I'm sure there's more, uh, but I was very attentive to at least two examples early in my uh, adulthood where I did not get the answer that I wanted. And later, I recognized that had I got that thing, it would have hurt me. I didn't know it at the time. I'm like, I was like anybody else at the time. Where, where's the answer? Are you listening? Where are you? Where's the thing? I really need this. This is a problem for me. Uh, I'm not praying for your will in this situation. Let's be clear. Here's the thing I need. This is what I want. You can do it. I can't. Please deliver. And I want you to know that had he answered on those two very specific, but again, probably more times than that, um, it would have been a negative thing for me. I am glad God used his wisdom and not mine, right? So, there, so there's um, reasons for that. God has a different perspective. So uh, I thought this was amazing. So aviation flight companies like Flight Aware keep track of planes uh, that are, all the planes that are in the sky at any given time, right? I just thought this was amazing. Um, according to them, now this is a 2017 statistic. Um, you know, I don't know how different, you know, how uh, different it would be today, but that's not all that many years ago. According to Flight Aware, in 2017, there were an average of almost, almost 10,000, not 9,000. Uh, where's my number? 9,728 planes. So almost 10,000 planes in the sky at any given time. That's, like, if I would have had to guess, that number's bigger than what I, that number's pretty big. And those planes are carrying uh, over two, over, oh, sorry, over one million people. There's over 1.2. 1.2 people in the sky above us at any I mean, not right, not right there. That's sort of the point of the aviation company, right? Like, they're keeping track of all that, keeping track of all that stuff. But over a million people in the sky, that's, that's a crazy thought to me. There's a million people 
up there somewhere, right? I'm glad somebody's paying attention, watching over that, uh, um, routing courses and, and destinations and, and paying attention where these different planes are. It could be, uh, it could be pandemonium. So God sees all the pieces at play. He sees, he sees everything, all the variables. He sees those things that can bring us harm. He sees those things that bring him the most glory. He sees those things that will, uh, will affect someone else in a negative way or hurt somebody else. And he's doing that for you and everyone else on the planet that seeks his face. John Piper said this, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, and you might be aware of three of them. I won't ask for a show of hands, but some of us are like, one. I just, just can I just be aware of one? Um, when we're not aware of what God is doing in our lives, it's not necessarily his fault. Come on, somebody, right? Like that, that might take some training on our behalf. We need to, we need to pay attention. 10,000 things God might be doing in your life, but we're only aware of three of them. So Peter is, is encouraging the church that you might not understand what you're going through. You might not understand what this is all about, but God has got you. God is taking care of things. He's pulling levers and pushing switches and making things happen behind the curtain that you might not understand it, but it is for the better good. Amen? Amen. So God sees what we do. God sees things that we don't see. God sees those things that we're going through, those trials, those hardships. God sees those things that get us down. Again, in 1 Peter, God is very aware of what the believers are experiencing. Their suffering, their persecution, um, all that they're going through. And Peter encourages them. Um, God is not going to be caught by surprise. Nothing's going to sneak up on him. There's nothing that's going to happen in your life that happened yesterday or that's going to happen tomorrow that's going to catch God off guard. He, he knows what's up. And, and he knows what we're experiencing. He knows what you're going through. He knows if there's suffering in your life. And, and uh, he can come along beside you and will come along beside you. I've shared this before, but there have been times where I've been going through a difficult time and and I'm praying and I'm seeking God. I want a way out. How I many of you know sometimes that God delivers you and gives you a way out? And sometimes uh, you need to endure the thing. Now, I have a favorite. My favorite is when he moves heaven and earth and just, just gets me out of the bad situation. Anybody with me? Anybody? Get, is that, that's, that's, I'm asking for that every time. I'm never asking to learn a lesson. I'm never asking, like, please make me stronger. Give, you know, teach me patience through this horrible thing. That's not me. I mean, you're more mature than me if you're doing that. Um, I want the easy, quick, miracle deliverance. Uh, but I know that, that that doesn't always come. And I know that when God chooses to do it that way, it is better for me. Right? It is better for me. When it's happening to you, let me know, because it's easy for me to see it in your life. Right? This is producing something in you. This is making you ten times the person that you were before. But it's hard to see it when when it's you, right? But God, um, whether he delivers you or whether he walks with you through this situation, and I've, I've been in times where I've been in prayer and I'm, I'm asking, seeking God for the deliverance, and I feel his presence. Suddenly, the answer isn't all that important anymore. It's that I know he's with me, and the answer seems to matter less and less. Now, it's, there's a key point in what I just said. I felt his presence. How many of you know he's still with you? Because I don't feel his presence. I'm not the preacher. I walk around enveloped in a cloud of God's spirit that I feel at all times. Now I'm not sure why you're laughing. Like, <laughs> thought you were under the belief that that's how preachers lived. Um, I don't always feel his presence, descend, his presence descend into the room as I'm praying. But I don't live my life by feelings. I live my life on the promises in the word of God. And whether I feel him, and most often, well, I don't say most, because I, you know, you, you experience the Lord's presence, I think, fairly frequently. But even when you don't, 
that doesn't change the promise that he is with you. And I know there's a great many times where just knowing and being reminded that he's with me through it, I can endure it. I don't have to have the easy deliverance. He sees you in the midst of your struggles, in your hurt and your pain, in your hardship, in your confusion and your tears. God sees that. And when we say God sees it, what we mean is that he cares about that. I want to share a, a quick uh, story with you uh, from the scriptures. We just talked about that, this in Old Testament survey. Old Testament survey, Wednesday nights, 630, um, good times. And uh, we just, uh, I won't tell you where we're at. You just come and find out. Um, but we're trying to move through the Old Testament in a way that it gives you an overall view of it. And we just covered, well, this will tell you where, where we were at. We just covered Hagar. Anybody remember Hagar? It's not that Viking guy, right? Not that cartoon. Remember that? Somebody, I don't know if he's still around. Um, but, but Hagar was the handmaiden, the servant to Abraham's wife, Sarah. And um, many of you know this story. It's fairly well known. But, but Abraham and his wife, Sarah, were unable to have children, and it, it, they were getting along in years. And then Sarah had this brilliant idea. Hey, I've got this servant. Um, why don't you sleep with her and, and see if you can't get, get her pregnant? And then you can have a child with the intention, you know, we'll raise this child as, as our child. And that's, uh, that's a little weird, yeah? Um, it turns out that, that that wasn't all that uncommon in those days. If, if you didn't have children, there was a stigma attached to that. There was, uh, I mean, it was just horrific. I mean, people today um, are, are, have shed many, many tears when they want to have a child and they cannot have a child. But there was, uh, if you can amplify that even more in, in biblical times, it was a really big deal. It was like, well, maybe... She, you know, some, some of it was like, there must be something wrong, not medically, but like maybe God has got something against them. Like there, something's wrong with them. Like God is punishing it. Like there was all kinds of horrible things. And so um, in that day and age, it wasn't completely uncommon to say if you, ha if you were well to do enough to have a servant to say, hey, I have an idea. So it wasn't, so this idea wasn't original to Sarah. However, God had promised Abraham and Sarah a child in the appropriate way despite the fact that they were that they were aging and so it's i was going to say it's funny it's not really funny um it's bizarre it sounds weird in our modern ears it says that abraham slept with uh, uh hagar his wife's servant and she became pregnant and because she became pregnant sarah began uh, what's uh, what's the wording um, Sarah became jealous of her. Really? It was the pregnancy. It was the pregnancy that did it. It wasn't, there was nothing before, the, but like before you found out she was pregnant, you had no problem. But that's our modern ears. Well, well think about, I, we just mentioned, the stigma that was attached and the horror if you were unable to have a child at that time. So now, not only have they used these somewhat, at least by contemporary standards, unconventional means to get pregnant, there were no test tubes. They had no test tubes. They, they didn't, they didn't no artificial insemination. Um, but the whole point of it is so that Abraham can have an heir. How, it's, it's understandable that Sarah would become even more jealous because now I couldn't give my husband a child, but my servant can. As you might imagine, that brought a little tension into the home, <laughs> right? Uh, Sarah, not such a good attitude against Hagar there for uh, some time. And uh, she, she, she leaves, she runs off and, and uh, she's all alone. Hagar uh, runs off, she's all alone. She's with child. She was under the employ of Abraham and, and Sarah, and, and she just he headed for the desert with no one, no, uh, no physician, no employer. She is all alone and pregnant with a child. And it's at that point 
God appears to her. So if you know the story, you know that she gives birth to Ishmael, not the promised child that God promised. But just because Abraham and Sarah went about this in the wrong way, and just because Ishmael wasn't the child of promise, doesn't mean that she was unimportant to the Lord. Doesn't mean that God didn't care. Well, I only care about Abraham and Sarah, and they messed up. We, we're going to have a... We're going to have a little chat about their lack of faith with this whole pregnancy thing. We're going to have a little conversation about that. But it's not as though Hagar was unimportant. God appears and ministers to Hagar, loves her, gives her some promises. And I'll show you, we'll show you Genesis 16, 3. For God appears and speaks to her and gives her some promises and comforts her and says, it's okay to go home. Verse 13, and she gave this name to the Lord, or Yahweh, who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. See, Hagar got it. She named the place, or named him, and, and, and described his character as you are the God who sees me. And I have now seen the one he manifested there before her. I've now seen the one who sees me. Well, that's not real clear, Hagar. I'm a little confused by that. No, the idea is she knows that if God sees her, that he's watching over her. He's looking out for her. He's paying attention to her and he cares for her. My friends, I would encourage you the same way this morning, that just as Hagar said, you know what, God, I'm happy to recognize and understand that you are a God who pays attention to what I'm going through. You see me, and you've given me through this incredible experience, you've given me the opportunity to also see you. I have now seen the one who sees me. Friends, this morning, God sees you. He cares about you. The name there in the Hebrew was, was Jehovah Roy, R-O-I, which means the God who sees me. Hagar recognized God's paying attention. He cares about me. That's the God we're serving this morning. He's always God. If he was, that, if he was the God who sees the heart with Samuel and David and and Jesse and the rest of the boys, if he's the God that cared and saw Hagar's plight and, and what she was experiencing and what she was going through, then God also sees you and what you're experiencing today. What's weighing on your heart this morning? Is it a, is it a broken relationship? You know, Kenny mentioned it's Mother's Day. That means some good things to some people and to some people that causes a lot of pain because the relationship wasn't right, maybe even abusive. Maybe, uh, maybe it's, you're struggling with secret sin in your life. Maybe the bills are piling up with no end in sight. Um, you, can't, you can't begin to see where the relief is going to come from. Maybe much like Sarah, you've tried to have a child and you can't, or maybe it's some miscarriages. Maybe it's an addiction, illness, or injury. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one. God wants you to know, Jehovah Roy wants you to know that he sees it. He sees you, he's paying attention, and he cares. Peter went on to say, casting all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Let's look at Psalm 56. Did we get Psalm 56 in there? I threw a million scripture at, at Patty uh, this morning. If you don't, I'll just read it. But I don't want to read something different than what you put up. All right. Because I've got a couple different versions I was looking at. All right. Look at this uh, Psalm 56, 8. Record my lament. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? Another translation says, you keep all my tears in a bottle. You say, well, that's outrageous. I'm not sure that's literal, but there's a bottle somewhere in heaven that contains the number of your tears, all right? So relax. 
Um, somebody says, you know, I was with you up until the bottle full of tears that God actually keeps. So that may be figurative, but what the psalmist understood is that, God, you pay attention. You see me when I shed tears. The psalmist was saying, well, whether there's a literal bottle, I frankly doubt it, like the no need. Um, but the psalmist is going, Lord, when I'm shedding tears, when I'm broken, when I'm wounded, when I'm hurting, when I'm pouring out my heart and I'm gushing before you, you recognize it. And you remember the last time I did it. Like you're, it's like, God, it's like you're keeping track. Like you know how many tears I've shed. Jesus pointed out that our Heavenly Father knows how many hairs are on our head. But we don't often talk about he knows how many tears that we have shed. The psalmist communicates what we're talking about this morning. But that's a God who cares about you. He cares deeply. We can trust him. We can cast our cares upon him. Finally, the last thing, and I'll just say this in, in conclusion, that God sees, the fourth thing, God sees what Jesus has done. God sees what Jesus has done. In other words, God sees our sinfulness, our transgressions, our iniquity, um, our inability <clears throat> To approach him, he sees all that through the lens of Jesus. Aren't you glad to know that? I don't, I don't know everybody in this room, and I certainly don't know uh, all of you online, but many of you may be under the misconception that a Christian is a Christian because they're such a good person, and they're going to heaven, or they think they're going to heaven, because they do so many good things that it outweighs the bad things that they do, right? That's a common misconception. I mean, it's both the Old Testament and the New Testament declare that that, that system doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. Isaiah said that our righteousness, our good acts, the good things that we do, don't earn anything for us. That our righteousness is like filthy rags to the Lord. Our righteous acts before a holy God is like trash. That's what Isaiah was saying. That's Old Testament. We know in the New Testament, Jesus, and then of course, Paul and other New Testament authors communicated to us that we are saved by grace through faith in the accomplished work of Jesus Christ not by our works, not by the things that we do. We can never earn our salvation. I encourage you to do good works. The world is a better place when people do good works. Anybody with me this morning? Like, like well, good works aren't required for salvation. No, but they're required to make this world a better place. Right? This, this world's pretty broken. It's pretty, it's pretty messed up. And... We got to get our lives together, get our act together, straighten ourselves out, get right, and put ourselves in a position where we're not constantly struggling for ourselves. Then we can impart to others and be a blessing to other people. That's where I believe God wants you this morning, um, to be a blessing to others. So we're not saved by works, but they sure are wonderful. <laughs> we sure do appreciate them. But God sees you through what Jesus has accomplished for you. God sees you through the blood of Christ. That's why we, we say that a, a Christian will, will speak as if they are as certain of heaven as if they were already there. How can they do that? If you're good, outweighs you. Why would they do that? If they think they're such a good person? Now, a Christian speaks that way because they understand it's through the cross that we attain a relationship and a covenant with Almighty God that it's through the accomplished work of what Jesus has done on our behalf. And if we trust him, believe in him, have confidence in what he accomplished for us, not in our own works, then we can inherit eternal life. In other words, when God looks at me, he doesn't see the brokenness, the, the sinner, um, all the mistakes that I made a long time ago. It's mistakes I'm still making, right? I'm still... I'm still making mistakes. But he measures our relationship through my faith in Christ, not in what I have to offer. Amen. Aren't you glad for that? 
Let's go to him in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we're thank so thankful this morning that just like in the scriptures, like we see with Hagar um, and, and numerous other scriptures, the, the word of God says that your eyes roam to and fro over the face of the earth. Lord, we thank you that you are watching. Lord, I ask you this morning that on Mother's Day, as we celebrate Mother's Day, that as your eyes and your gaze falls upon this place, that you would bless the moms, that you would encourage the moms. I mean, and, and moms are in so many different states. The, the, the ladies that are trying to become pregnant, that, that might be having difficulty or, or maybe miscarriages. And then there's, there's just the exhausted moms that have little ones um, that, that could, could just use some, some energy. Maybe older moms are, are missing the kids or sometimes the kids, because of, because of something, maybe they're, not, maybe they're not in communication anymore. Mother's Day can mean so many different things. Lord God, but you see it. You see every mom in this place. You see every would-be mom in this place. You see every mom that's watching this online. Lord, I ask that you minister to them at the point of their need. I'm glad this morning that not just on Mother's Day, but yesterday and every day hereafter, you see moms. We ask for a special blessing on mom, but Lord, there are those in this place this morning and those watching online that are struggling, they're going through something, going through a hardship. Lord, we would love to see deliverance, freedom. We'd love to see the miracle. I'm a huge fan of miracles. But Lord, if they don't get the instant deliverance that, that we all enjoy so much, Lord, I pray that, that your presence would be felt with them. That if they're meant to walk through this time, then allow them to feel the manifested, tangible presence of Almighty God if they, if they never have before. And walk with them through this difficult, difficult time. Lord, minister to each and every one this morning. We thank you for seeing us. Um, and uh, we just ask you to bless uh, each and every one in the awesome and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. Well, should we do a little, uh, should we do a little giveaway? Here, let's draw some names. All right.